And one of the strangest and most unexpected finds of this year was a new early diverging thyreophorin coming from South America. And that alone isn't the strange part. There's other early members that were diverging in this group, like Scutellosaurus from the Chianta Formation in Northern Arizona. And Scutellosaurus lived during the early Jurassic. And this is right when Pangaea was starting to break up and fall into the different continents that we know today. So it makes sense that something like Scutellosaurus could have still made it to South America. But that's not the weird part either. Because the really weird part is that the newly named Jacopil Kainukura isn't from the early Jurassic, or even the Jurassic at all. It's from the early part of the late Cretaceous, meaning that there's over 100 million years separating it and some of its closest relatives like Scutellosaurus, which is kind of weird when you think about it. Now there are other fossils of other early diverging thyreophorans like Euxesaurus coming from China, but that's still 80 million years before Jacopil. And also Euxesaurus seems to be taking the four-legged stance that we know from the more famous thyreophorans, those being the stegosaurs and the other group being the ankylosaurs. So it seems closer to those groups than Jacopil does because Jacopil was still moving on just two feet. And it was also relatively small with this sub-adult specimen, so almost fully grown, being only about 1.5 meters long. So maybe five feet if it was pretty big. As far as specific relations though, it does seem like it started to diverge just before the divergence between the ankylosaurs and the stegosaurs. But there's still gonna be a lot of testing on this because it's pretty partial right now. And in fact, some researchers have even said on places like Twitter that they reviewed this paper when it was still in press and it still got through because there was good science in it, but they think this animal might even be an armored ceratopsian. Now I say it's kind of partial and what does that mean? It just means we don't have a lot of fossils and specific bones from it. We have some of the osteoderms that were along the sides and back that show it was armored, as well as some fragmentary limbs, which show that it at least had limbs, as well as some of parts of the lower jaw and some parts of the upper jaw. And actually the lower jaw is much more complete than the upper jaw. The upper jaw just has a very fragmentary premaxilla and a very fragmentary maxilla bone. So those really aren't giving us a ton of help unless you're looking at very specific details on them. The fact that it's so partial means there's a lot of places it could still end up phylogenetically. For example, if we had more of those osteoderms and spines running along the back and some of those became more plate-like, we could probably say, no, it actually is closer to things like Stegosaurus rather than Ankylosaurus, but we just don't have those fossils, which means we need to start looking at other possibilities. And one of those possibilities is just that it's entirely new to science. This is a group of dinosaurs that we have never found any of its representatives before, and it's just totally unique. Again, there's also the chance it could be a very early diverging thyreophorin, which also makes sense. And finally, again, there's that ceratopsian idea, and there's a few different reasons for this. First, during the early part of the late Cretaceous, ceratopsians weren't quite as big as we often think. Things like Stracosaurus and even Triceratops hadn't evolved yet and most Ceratopsians were actually pretty small for most of their history, especially when you think of things like Cetacosaurus or Archaeoceratops. These aren't big animals necessarily, they just ended up getting big towards the end of the Cretaceous. And part of the reason some researchers do think that it could be a Ceratopsian is because of some of the strange features it has for a thyreophorin. For example, when we're looking at the jaw, it's pretty short, which is much more indicative of a high bite pressure and something that we actually do find in the Ceratopsians. And still on that same concept of the bite, some of the tooth wear on the teeth that were found in the jaw is much more like that of Ceratopsians and even the Heterodontosaurs, which may or may not actually be related to Ceratopsians, but it's much more like those animals than it is like any thyreophorin. So if it is a thyreophorin, it's doing something entirely different from them. And thinking about features that it has that other animals don't, it has some processes on the articular bone that would have helped for a lot of muscle attachments. And other Ornithischians, the entire group of Ornithischians, so not just Ceratopsians, not just Thyreophorans, but all of them including Hadrosaur-like things, none of those had these same processes. But the Tyrannosaurus did, and no one is suggesting that this animal was a Tyrannosaur. Instead, it just seems to have actually converged on that same trait. And it's a great example of how just because there's a specific trait doesn't mean animals are related. They can converge on it. And not every lineage is going to access that same trait because you need that evolutionary mutation to occur. So it's something very specific that doesn't necessarily show up everywhere, but can be really helpful when it does show up. 
The combination of all these traits, as well as the fact that Jack of Hell shows up entirely separate from any other group of Thyreophorans, really just highlights that we need to do a lot more paleontology with them, especially in the early Jurassic and middle Jurassic, because those are really important times for understanding their diversification. And potentially even just one fossil from the middle Jurassic could help us understand better where Jack of Hill fits in and how the diversification of stegosaurs and ankylosaurs actually did happen. 